Well, if there was any doubt about why those two were given the Bridging Leadership Award, I'm sure that's been dispelled. So our next speaker is Paul Pullman, but unfortunately he wasn't able to be here with us in person today. So he sent a video message, and I just wanted to mention that uh, Paul won the Bridging Leadership Award in 2014, and many of you here certainly know him. He is now the chair of the B Team, co-founder and chair of Imagine, and author of his great new book, Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. So let's watch this video about Paul. Well, hello everybody, I'm Paul Pullman, and it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend Andre Hoffman, and first of all, congratulate him and all the other recipients for this worthy recognition. Although it's not difficult to introduce Andre, it is difficult to do it in a few minutes only, given the wide scope of issues that he's actively involved in. Andre is a true bridging leader. Indeed, collaborative action to la drive lasting societal change has always been his main focus. Three areas truly stand out and I believe define him. First is his relationship with nature. Whilst many think that their job is to save and earn money, for Andre, above all, it's first and foremost about saving the planet. He is a true conservationist, a steward of the planet and a champion of the earth. He understands that we are one with nature and frankly knows very well that humanity would not exist without it. His father was a renowned ornithologist and that has certainly rubbed off on him. Long before others did, Andre already advocated ferociously that natural systems on which we depend are under pressure and that it erodes ultimately the human and societal systems as well. We have now clearly discovered that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet and anything we can't do forever is by definition unsustainable. Andre previously was the vice chair of WWF and has always been actively involved in a wide range of areas to preserve our natural habitat or reverse nature losses. From the Mediterranean wetland preservations to championing science-based targets for nature, to bringing the people together with the intent SDG actions and many other things. The second area that defines Andre is seeing business as a force for good. Andre has long argued that the purpose of a company is not to make money, but first and foremost to serve society. Business certainly needs to have a return, but this has to come from solving the world's problems, not from creating the world's problems, as we argue in our book, Net Positive. As Ross Vice Chair and Genentech Board Member, as well as having been previously on many other boards, he's seen the power of business to drive chains from close by. COVID showed that you can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. And with his family company, Ross, he's been active in healthcare, especially in the area of diagnostics during the pandemic. And that certainly has resulted in saving millions of lives. Planetary boundary erosion also erodes trust in business as we're living well beyond these planetary boundaries. All businesses depend on nature one way or another and loss of species or biomass certainly is irreversible. Andre therefore is a passionate advocate of the multi-stakeholder business model that yes, also includes planet and future generations. Working the broader system change is needed and redefining new business models. Via, for example, is Hoffman Global Institute at INSEAD, or the WEF Board of Trustees, or as a member of the B Team, or a board member of Systemic, a company that intends to drive positive disruptions in economic systems. The third area that defines him is Andre himself and the role that his wife Rosalie and the wider family actually is playing. Andre has long realized that he has won the lottery ticket of life and that he wants to put himself to the service of others, knowing that by doing so he's better off himself as well. The whole family are great global citizens, fighting many worthy causes, be it with the support for reforms for the educational system or creating new impact measurement tools for social and environmental capital, be it with the intent platform that he started with Rosalie to connect people 
to foster development that is sustainable and long-term, be it with his many charitable givings. Always supported by Rosalie and many times by his children as well. Above all, Andre is a great human being, a family man with a great sense of humility and humanity, who understands the magic of listening, the importance of power, the power of the importance of purpose and the power of collaboration. Congratulations once more. Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks for being a dear friend. Enjoy this special evening and above all, the well-deserved recognition. Thank you very much. And to present the award, you may have noticed that each of the presenters of the award were former award winners, which is part of the mycelium-like network that we hope is spreading around the world, is my friend Eddie Ndopu, who won the award two years ago, unfortunately when we had to be on Zoom, but was with us last year as a guest, and this year because of a special relationship that he has with Andre, is going to present the award to him. Eddie, please. <sighs> oh, Andre, Andre, Andre. <laughs> you said earlier that I should not embarrass you by boasting about you. Well, I think in this context, it's better to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. So here goes nothing. I had the great honor and joy of meeting Mr. Andre Hoffman several years ago at the World Economic Forum. I was a young activist and I had tremendous imposter syndrome, being one of the few young people invited into the hallways of power. I shared a stage with Andre, and I was immediately struck by his tremendous empathy and his unassuming nature. I was expecting to find a corporate titan surrounded by throngs of executive assistants who had assistants, and instead, I met somebody who escorted me all the way out of the building. It was an inaccessible building, and I was the only visibly disabled person in the room, and you stayed with me and escorted me throughout. Little did I know that fast forward a couple of years, our paths would cross again. This is a full circle moment for me personally, because at the age of two, I was diagnosed with a rare degenerative condition called spinal muscular atrophy. I was given a prognosis of five. I'm 31 years old and I have now outlived myself. I have outlived myself by 26 years and counting. I am now on cutting edge therapeutic, a treatment developed by Roche that will prolong my life and that will enable me to have a greater quality of life, enabling me to continue to be a global change maker. Andre Hoffman, you made this possible. I remember talking to you on the phone and you asked me about my health and how I'm doing and you regularly check in on me and for that I am eternally grateful. You embody what in my home country South Africa we call Ubuntu, the philosophy that says I am because you are, you are because we are. I can't think of anybody more deserving of this award than you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Andre Hoffman.
imaginations. So yes, thank you. You did thank embarrass you. me. Thank you very much. It's very kind. Thank you. So I, I'm, I'm really, um, you know, we've had very strong words tonight already about humility and about uh, the, 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 the power of what we're trying to achieve. I, I have the impression I'm doing a deep dive into uh, a New York philanthropy definition, of what, what, what it means to have so many generous people in a stage. And so I'm going to again say that I am uh, terribly humbled by this, by the, not terribly, but properly humbled by this, this award. I'm very grateful, you know, that uh, somebody like Paul Polman says so many nice things about me was something that didn't really uh, reach my consciousness until I saw it happening tonight. But then, if I already have the opportunity to talk to all of you, I think I should start by doing it properly. I think I should get, use the opportunity, the five minutes I've got, to sort of uh, share some thoughts with you, and in particular, share some thoughts about, um, about the way we work as a society. Um, I have a great privilege to be, to be living two lives at the same time. Um, I would like um, certain members of my family who are here tonight, I grew up in a nature reserve in the south of France in the Camargue. Nature was an important part of our youth, and to this day, as Paul uh, told you, uh, we, we, we try to, to, to preserve that nature through a couple of philanthropy activities. So I have spent a whole 30 years of my life working in NGOs and trying to make sure that NGOs work efficiently. At the same time, my great-grandfather started a company, the Roche Group, which is a, today the largest pharmaceutical company on the planet, uh, which is an innovative business trying to propose uh, solutions to unmet medical needs. So we are, uh, we are involved in research and discovery by using our pharmaceutical business and our, um, and our diagnostic business. Now, why do I tell you that? Because if we're talking about bridges, I think that's one of the biggest bridges I can think of. You know, on one side you have business, on the other side you have NGOs. On one side you are, you are creating value, on the other one you are spending it. And for many, many, many years, I live this daily contradiction where people are saying people who make money are bad and people who spend money are good. And that's something we really need to, 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 to challenge. We are all in this together. The idea of saying that it's okay to make money because we need the money to grow, and then we can repair the damage done by doing philanthropic work, I really challenge you to think this through once. This is, this is quite patently absurd. You, you, you cut down a forest, you make a hundred, you then give ten, 10 back to a philanthropy to be able to replant the forest. Whereby if you had taken 10 every year, you would have this forever. So th there, is a, there is a very simple concept, and my friend Indra now he has, uh, who used to be the, the chairman of uh, PepsiCo, has, um, uh, the, the CEO of PepsiCo, has often said that it's not how you spend the money that matters, it's how you make it. And no, nowhere is that more important to understand than into businesses which have a noble causes. Our, our comp family company has given itself as a purpose doing today what the patient needs next. We have more than 100,000 employees on the planet who are all driven by the same purpose. How can we help the patient? How can we make sure that sufferance gets alleviated? How can we help people like Eddie? How can we move forward in doing something positive? And yet, Society does not recognize this. Society believes that philanthropists are doing a better job than we are doing. I'm sorry, I'm not going to make myself many friends tonight, but <laughs> I have to tell you that. Philanthropy is not the solution. Philanthropy is like putting a plaster on a wooden leg. Philanthropy is something you do after the damage. And that's something that we really seriously have to address. We need to make sure that these sort of uh, excesses do not happen. Nobel Prize win in 1978, Milton Friedman, the business of business is business. So our job is to make money, our job, you realize this dichotomy, uh, in, my, in my company role, my job is to make money and then I redistribute it to society through taxes and through dividends and, and, through, uh, and through salaries and then society will sort out the details, i.e. the externalities. Well, I think that's absurd. We should make sure that we create value in a way which is uh, indispensable. I'm not suggesting that companies should become NGO. 
although we might think about NGO becoming a bit more like companies, but that's perhaps another conversation. Uh, in, the, in the long run, what's important is to admit the fact that we are all in this together. Every human activity, every human endeavor has a consequence on the way we live, on the one planet system that Paul just, just, uh, just um, uh, uh, alluded to. So let's look at this in, a, in, in terms of solution. I see we can, three things we can do. The first thing we can do is to try to measure the, sorry, is to try to measure the impact of our activities. So in, in simple terms, we have an accounting problem. At the moment, we only look at financial flows when we know blatantly, blatantly that this is not the best way of measuring our activity. Every action humanity endeavors has an impact on the social capital, and we've talked about the social issue just now. Yes, women's rights are human rights, absolutely. You know, we need to make sure that social systems function. We need to treat everybody with respect. We need to trust each other. We need to make sure that society functions to the benefit of all. It has to be inclusive. It has to be all-encompassing. All we need that. We need systems that work. And, you know, the pandemic has just demonstrated that when we are under stress, we have flares out of inequality, which are difficult to cope with. Um, we, we need to look at the human system, and that, that's one of my favorites. How do we make sure that every individual can actually live their values? How can you find self-realization into your daily life? As an employer, I'm not interested in employing people who are just coming for the salary. I'm interested in people who are coming to serve the purpose of the company. Together, we can do something much bigger than you can do it individually. So the idea of coming to work for Roche because you want to save a life, because you want to improve the condition of the patient, is much more, pot it is much more potent and is much more convincing than the idea of coming for the salary, the retirement benefits, and the, and the holidays. So we need to work on social system, we need to work on human system, and then, of course, we have nature. Nature not as the nice birds, the nice, uh, the nice elephants, the tiger, the Amazon. Nature as the life system support on Earth. Humanity will not survive long if nature is dysfunctional. And I think we all know that. In the same way as we all know that happiness is important, in the same way as we all know that if we don't respect our neighbors, we're not going to go very far. So how do we internalize that? How do we make sure that we can use it? I would contend it has to be based on a new accounting system where we measure the impact on the free capitals, the social, the human, and the natural, and we use the interdependency between these free capitals to produce the, 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 the produced capital, which is the one we measure. We all know that there is unpaid work that is indispensable in society. I mean, we're talking about women's rights. You know, most women uh, partners stay at home in order to look after the family, which is a much more important job than going to earn a salary, and yet we don't account for that. GDP doesn't include this. We, we can continue on that uh, uh, later. But once we have this uh, accounting system, and once we can actually de determine what it is that actually matters to us as a society, we need to make sure that we restore some of the, some of the natural balance. And there we get into this nature-based solution element, which is coming more and more to the front, especially post-pandemic. How can we... Nature-based solution is not just planting trees. Nature-based solution is how can we get nature to work for us, rather than trying to dominate it and, ex and exhaust it and not look after it in the long term. So planting trees is a way of doing this, but it's not the only one. What we are talking about is a new contract between nature and humanity. How can we create something which is mutually beneficial? How can we regenerate the damaged system? And how can we make sure that, you, that that natural system supports us? And now we get to the crux of all this. How do we succeed in creating that? How do we change the world so that we do have uh, natural accounting and that we do have and that we do have a, lead, and that we do have a, 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 a nature-based solution used on a regular basis. What we need is leadership. What we need is people who are able to take bold and courageous decisions to bring forward these choices. People who are not driven just by the immediate maximization of short-term profit like Milton Friedman has determined it, but people who are trying to maximize the impact for the system, people who are promoting trust, people who are promoting togetherness, people who are acting on, on, by thinking about the others. And frankly, if you want to see this new world order, I can, on, I can only see businesses run in the proper manner to be able to bring us to this status. It's not going to be um, uh, the non-profit sector who is succeeding to do that. 
sustainability and the and, and the, the prosperous the sustainable prosperity we are aiming at will only be achieved by sustainable system and that includes financial stability you cannot have uh, uh, somebody relying just on donations that is a system that is inherently unstable in the same way as you cannot have a system that does not treat everybody equally because that's inherently unstable as well so uh, this, this uh, leadership award touches me greatly, as you can probably hear because my voice is trembling a bit. Um, this leadership award touches me greatly because it is exactly what we should be doing. Thank you to Synergos to do this. Thank you to have, uh, to, to have uh, uh, selected me as one of your recipients. Very glad to hear that from the other side of the Atlantic, people have heard what we're trying to do. That's, that's very exciting. Uh, thank, you, thank you as well. <laughs> you know, thank you as well for, for, for um, uh, Eddie, who making, being so kind to me, to Paul, to be so kind to me, to, to friends from Genentech and from the company who have sort of decided to come here tonight. And I would like to, to finish these remarks, which are already far too long because we have to go to, uh, to, to des dessert later on. Um, just a little story. Imagine now um, planet Earth. Planet Earth goes on holidays. Planet Earth has had enough. Planet Earth goes and travels in the cosmos. It crosses another planet. The other planet says, hi, how are you? And, the, and planet Earth replies, ah, I've got a bad case of homo sapiens. <laughs> and, and the other planet replies what we have all replied to all our friends in the last two years. The other planet looks at planet Earth and says, don't worry. It won't last. And that's precisely because I don't want this to happen, that I'm talking to you here about leadership. We are part of the solution. If all of, the, of us here, whatever our activities, join together in this vision where we can create an inclusive society for all, we can save the planet still. If we don't do it, well, you know, that will be the end of the dinner. But thank you very much for listening to me, and thank you very much, everybody. Needed, but oh is it on oh wonderful I usually I just yell thank you so much oh yes please hold that up and we can give him another round of applause please for such an amazing inspiring speech <laughs> we wanted to encourage our audience to interact with you and submit some questions which so many of them have come in and I've read them all and they are brilliant but we only have time for a couple, so I will uh, shoot some to you if you could just share your thoughts. One question that came in, if you could build just one bridge to help heal the world, what would it be? Well, uh, after having listened to what I just said, it strikes, it strikes to me that we need to create a way which will un unite us all into the way we use this planet. We are all in this together means not just that we need to uh, delegate certain tasks to certain people. We need to try to make sure that all our actions are driven by the response, sense of responsibility we can have one against the other. So my bridge would be a complicated bridge because it would unite us all and therefore it would be impossible to use. Sorry. It's a dream. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that answer. Another one I have here is the Dalai Lama and late Archbishop Tutu advocated fueling action by joy, not by anger or hatred. What do you do to create joy in your life that fuels you? Um, well, sorry, it's, it's again one of these corny answers, but it's about love, you know. We need to love each other. We need to look at each other in the eyes and love each other. There's, and, and, you know, the, the, there is something worth finding in every person. You know, this, this, this humility that Darren was talking about is absolutely crucial. We do not know everything. We don't know what, what, what um, uh, people in, in, in other parts of the world want. We need to be able to listen. And we will not listen and be able to trust relationship if we don't love each other. And it's, it's not that difficult, is it? I mean, who, who wants to go and kill the neighbor? I mean, this is not the right moment to discuss this, of course. But... Anyway, so, so love would be my answer. And, right. it, and it, it does make me happy to be in love. Myself. Now, this one I'm a bit biased on because as the next generation after yours, I'm quite curious what you have to say. And I know that your son is joining us tonight as well, so I'm sure he'll be tuning into this question. What advice would you offer the next generation about tomorrow, next week, the next decade? 
So um, the first one is a simple one. Don't do what we have done. Because what we have done has led us into the... You see? <laughs> this was not a prop. It was... <laughs> but, you know, but, but, but seriously, um, um, we, we've been talking about the same system for generations now. You know, uh, the, grand, the great philanthropists we honor here tonight have thought they had it licked when they created big philanthropies. Thought they could, we would solve the problems of the planet by donating money in a clever way. Well, it hasn't worked. You know, we still are going down the drain. Uh, if, if I look at um, the, the, the millennium goal that the United Nations put together for the Agenda 2000, uh, you know, we created an enormous amount of wealth and we lifted an enormous amount of people out of poverty. Humanity has never been as healthy, as long-living, as well-educated as it is at the moment. But look at the cost. You know, so, so, some people are getting incredibly um, uh, powerful and wealthy, other people are getting poorer and poorer every day. Uh, the pandemic has precipitated another 200 million back into the, uh, into the zone of less than three dollars a day. Um, you know, the, the system, as we, as we planned, is not working. So let's change it. You know, this is an opportunity. We can go and do something new. We can, we can create solutions which are not really taking into account just the paradigm of short-term profit maximization, but are looking at a reasonable approach to everybody's future. So my, my, my advice would be don't do the same, but do better, which of course is passing on the bucket. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for your questions and thank you for those inspiring answers, Mr. Hoffman. And congratulations once again. Thank you.